Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to Q2 2024 MasterCraft Boat, Boat Holdings Incorporated Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would like now to turn the conference over to Bobby Potter, Vice President of Strategy and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss MasterCraft's second quarter performance for fiscal 2024. As a reminder, Today's call is being webcast live and will also be archived on our website for future listening. With me on this morning's call are Fred Brightville, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman, and Tim Oxley, Chief Financial Officer. Fred will begin with a review of our operational highlights from the second quarter. Tim will then discuss our financial performance for the quarter. Then Fred will provide some closing remarks before we open the call for Q&A. Before we begin, we would like to remind participants that the information contained in this call is current only as of today, February 7, 2024. The company assumes no obligation to update any statements, including forward-looking statements. Statements that are not historical facts are forward-looking statements and subject to the safe harbor disclaimer in today's press release. Additionally, on this conference call, we will discuss non-GAAP measures that include or exclude special or items not indicative of our ongoing operations. For each non-GAAP measure, we will provide the most directly comparable GAAP measure in today's press release. This includes a reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to our GAAP results. There is also a slide deck summarizing our financial results in the investor section of our website. As a reminder, unless otherwise noted, the following commentary is made on a continuing operations basis. With that, I will turn the call over to Fred. Thank you, Bobby, and good morning, everyone. Our business performed well during the second quarter as we delivered better than expected results despite continuing macroeconomic uncertainty and a highly competitive retail environment. Near term, we remain focused on rebalancing dealer inventories with anticipated demand to ensure the health of our dealer network. Despite near term challenges, our portfolio of consumer centric brands, a highly variable cost structure, and our strong balance sheet provide us with the confidence to continue to invest in long-term growth initiatives. In addition to maintaining a resilient balance sheet and investing for the future, our disciplined approach to capital allocation allows us the flexibility to return cash to shareholders through our share repurchase program. Views regarding the economic outlook are mixed and uncertain, which is limiting retail demand visibility. Recently, we observed some relatively positive indications that favor cautious optimism, including the expectation for lower interest rates, improving consumer sentiment, and unexpectedly strong GDP growth. We continue to monitor retail results and assess the overall business and economic environment. We are confident that our flexible operating model will allow us to mitigate near-term risk and capitalize on the upside when we return to growth. Although inventories modestly increased during the quarter, seasonal increase was less than typically typical in pre-COVID periods. We prioritized pipeline rebalancing and dealer health as we entered fiscal 2024. Other industry participants are now signaling softening demand while pairing their expectations significantly in some cases. We believe the decisive action we took to right-size our production plan from the start of fiscal 2024 has allowed us to transition to a more historical pattern of inventory build and destock. Dealer inventory units normally increase to a relative peak during our fiscal third quarter before declining throughout the summer selling season. While dealer inventories remain higher than we consider optimal, we expect levels to improve by the end of the fiscal year. As other inventory, as, excuse me, as other industry participants begin to react to lower demand, the retail environment has become increasingly competitive. Dealers continue to focus on destocking to manage dealer to manage inventory levels and reduce floor plan costs. The resulting increase in promotional activity is pressuring margins across the industry. 
Results from early boat shows are mixed, although many of the latest shows have exceeded expectations. We anticipate that retail activity will support our range of wholesale expectations. The environment is very competitive as inventory availability has improved, providing consumers with more choices. The good news is that there are buyers. However, a general lack of urgency is contributing to increased promotional activity. Our dealer inventory levels and production plans position our dealers to capitalize on the remaining boat shows in the upcoming summer selling season. We expect to have a clearer picture of retail demand as we progress through our third and fourth quarters. Despite the cyclical headwinds facing the industry, we are well positioned to pursue our capital allocation priorities, including investment and long-term growth. We are prudently investing in targeted initiatives that will take advantage of the industry's positive underlying secular trends. I will briefly discuss one such initiative as I review the operational results of our brands. With our financial position secure and our current strategic growth initiatives fully funded, we expect to continue to allocate most of our free cash flow for the year to our EPS accretive share repurchase program. Our balance sheet and capital allocation framework provides us with flexibility to adjust our stance from cautious to optimistic, depending on our view of the cycle. Given the currently suppressed marine environment and near-term uncertainty, we will remain opportunistic in our approach to growth through M&A. Let me now briefly review some of the latest developments across our brands. Our Mastercraft brand, net sales were $73 million for the quarter, down 33% from the record prior year period. The decrease in net sales was in line with our expectations given the planned production decrease to rebalance dealer inventories in response to lower retail demand. The Mastercraft team is actively supporting our dealer partners at boat shows occurring across the country and globally. Mastercraft performed particularly well at the Atlanta, Seattle, and Salt Lake City shows. At Crest, net sales were $17 million for the quarter, down 54% from the prior year period, as expected due to a pullback in production to align with retail demand. Early boat show results have been mixed, but encouraging as consumer interest in pontoons has been better than anticipated. However, consumers lack a sense of urgency and the sales cycle is taking longer than expected in the last few years. Crest performed particularly well at the Minneapolis show the largest pontoon market in the U.S., along with the Chicago, Atlanta, and Detroit shows. On the strategic front, we will be launching a new pontoon brand for model year 2025 that will be built in our Crest facility. This new brand was conceived through our consumer-centric approach to strategic planning and will be focused on targeting an affluent customer with an elevated on-water and in-water experience. We will be launching the brand to consumers in the spring and look forward to sharing more information on this exciting growth initiative with investors on our next earnings call. At Aviera, net sales were $10 million for the quarter, down 30% compared to the prior year period. During the quarter, Aviera was focused on the ramp up of the all new AV28, an impressive product platform consisting of four distinct model variants. We expect the AV28 production to continue to ramp up for the remainder of the year. Aviera has also expanded its distribution network by adding eight new domestic and international points of distribution fiscal year to date. Boat show results for Aviera have been mixed, but we were encouraged by the results at some shows, including New York and Seattle. We recently hired Mike O'Connell, a 30-year industry veteran, to be president of Aviera. Mike's senior leadership roles at several boat manufacturers gives him a wealth of experience and knowledge that he will leverage to improve Aviera's operational performance and execute its growth strategy. I will now turn the call over to Tim, who will provide more detailed discussion of our financial results. Tim? Thanks, Fred. Focusing on the top line, net sales for the quarter were $99.5 million, a decrease of $59.7 million, or 38% from the record prior year period. This decrease was primarily due to lower unit sales volume and an increase in dealer incentives, partially offset by higher prices and favorable mix. Dealer incentives include higher floor plan financing costs as a result of increased dealer inventories and interest rates, and other incentives as the retail environment remains very competitive. For the fourth quarter, our gross margin was 18.8%, a decrease of 520 basis points when compared to the prior year period. 
Lower margins were the result of lower cost absorption due to planned decreased production volume. Higher dealer incentives and higher costs related to material labor and overhead inflation, partially offset by higher prices. Operating expenses were relatively consistent for the second quarter of fiscal 2024 compared to the prior year period. In pursuit of growth, growth initiatives, we continue to invest in product development and marketing. Turning to the bottom line, adjusted net income for the year decreased to $6.3 million, or $0.37 cents per diluted share, computed using an estimated annual effective tax rate of 22%. This compares to adjusted net income $21.3 million, or $1.20 for the prior year period, computed using a tax rate of 23%. Adjusted EBITDA decreased to $9.8 million for the quarter, compared to $29.8 million in the prior year period. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 9.8%, down 890 basis points from 18.7% in the prior year period. Our balance sheet remains incredibly strong as we ended the quarter with nearly 209 million of total liquidity, including nearly 109 million of cash and short-term investments, and 100 million of availability under a revolving credit facility. We ended the quarter with no debt debt as cash and short-term investments exceed our outstanding debt balance. Here today, we have generated more than 19 million of cash flow from operations. Our balance sheet positions us exceptionally well and provides us with ample financial flexibility to ensure sound operations through the business cycle and the ability to fund strategic growth initiatives. During the quarter, we spent approximately 4.4 million to repurchase more than 214,000 shares of our common stock. Since initiating our share repurchase program in June of 2021, we've spent more than $58 million to repurchase over 2.3 million shares. These cumulative repurchases provided a 13% benefit for fiscal second quarter adjusted net income per share. We expect to continue to return cash to shareholders while prioritizing financial flexibility and high return investments in the business that generate growth and long-term shareholder value. Looking forward, we are narrowing our guidance range for the full year. Consolidated net sales is now expected to be between $400 million and $412 million, with adjusted EBITDA between $42 million and $47 million, and adjusted earnings per share between $1.53 and $1.78. We also now expect capital expenditures to be approximately $20 million for the full year. For the third quarter of fiscal 2024, Consolidated net sales is, is expected to be approximately $92 million, with adjusted EBITDA of approximately $7 million, and adjusted earnings per share of approximately $0.23. Cents. Although our guidance reflects a significant decline in earnings from fiscal 2023, we expect to generate positive free cash flow, which is a testament to our flexible, highly variable cost structure and proactive cost control efforts. I'll now turn the call back to Fred for his closing remarks. Thanks, Tim. As we continued our focus on rebalancing dealer inventories, our business performed well during the second quarter by delivering better than expected results despite the continuing economic uncertainty in a highly competitive retail environment. We continue to exercise a disciplined approach to capital allocation. Over the past two years, we've returned more than $58 million of excess cash to our shareholders through our share repurchase program. Our strong balance sheet provides us with financial flexibility and affords us the opportunity to pursue our strategic growth initiatives. The upcoming launch of our exciting new pontoon brand is an example of why we are confident in our ability to deliver long-term growth for our shareholders. As we move beyond inventory rebalancing, we are determined to leverage our strong and growing portfolio of brands, deliver on our commitments, pursue long-term growth opportunities, and generate exceptional shareholder returns. Operator, you may now open the line for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 11 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. The first question comes from Joe Altobello with Raymond James. Your line is now open. 
Thanks. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, so first question I wanted to ask about the guidance, it implies a sequential decline in sales and EBITDA uh, from Q2 to Q3, which is unusual. Uh, is, that due to, uh, is that all due to heightened promotional activity, or are there other dynamics going on in the business? There are other dyna dynamics, Joe. For instance, we were shut down for a full week of production due to snow here in Tennessee. You know, an ice storm affected production at uh, Crest as well. The other thing we're doing is making sure we allow our dealers some breathing room to, uh, to clear their decks, uh, to clear the decks for additional inventory um, in Q4. Okay, that's helpful, Tim. And maybe in terms of you know units this year, I think the expectation at least three months ago, was units would be down over 40%. Uh, is, is that still the case? And if so, does that get field inventories to where you need them to be by fiscal year end? That, that's what we're expecting, Joe. Okay. And so it sounds like you guys will exit the fiscal year clean, if you will, from, from an inventory perspective. A a absolutely. And, and, and keep in mind the all important fourth quarter of, of our retail uh, will determine exactly um, where we land. Okay, got it. Thank you. One moment for our next question. The next question comes from Craig Kennison with Baird. Your line is now open. Okay, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. I wanted to start with just a a question, Fred, on your perspective on the health of your dealer network. We know they're under a lot of strain with you know, skinny margins and uh, excess floor plan costs, but uh, how would you characterize the health of, of your dealer network? I would characterize it overall as, as very good. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't an occasional issue here or there, but it's been very sporadic and isolated. Um, but certainly, as you indicated, dealers are in general uh, heavily inventory, uh, incurring additional costs, and they're selling at very tight margins, which is not a long-term sustainable situation. We don't expect them to be in that situation long-term. We expect to get through this and be able to return to more normal conditions. Greg, I would I would add we we monitor the you know dealers' health. Uh, we're watching very closely. We have a um, you know, monthly meeting with the floor plan companies to make sure there are no, uh, no early warning signs of duress, and uh, we'll continue that through the, through, through the season. Is there a way to frame the number of units by which you, know, you exceed maybe target inventory levels in the channel? Well, the way we think about it, Craig, is again, where we're trying to end up at the end of the year, and this year, we still um, expect to pull out somewhere between 600 and 800 units. Split fairly That's evenly really between you know, Mass Craft and uh, Crest Brands. That's really helpful. And then, I guess one more question on the decision to add a pontoon brand within the Crest facility. Just, if you would, talk about any sort of capital requirements uh, that were that uh, entails and what's the broader vision for having two brands instead of just one? Um, first of all, uh, minimal capital expense um, don't have the same tooling requirements on the pontoon business as, as you would in the fiberglass in terms of molds. Uh, no facility expansion uh, directly related to that. A, a facility expansion was uh, recently completed within the last year that provides the capability uh, to be able to produce this product. So there was some investment made, but it has been made historically. And, and uh, as we look forward, uh, don't expect any significant capital allocation uh, to the new brand. With regard to the positioning, um, because of its premium, almost ultra premium positioning, uh, we felt it was appropriate to have a distinct brand and be able to target it to those consumers specifically. It will uh, touch on the upper end of the offering uh, in terms of price points of the Crest brand. So there's some minor overlap, but uh, in general, it's gonna be uh, positioned 
differently than the Crest print. Great, thank you. One moment for the next question. The next question comes from Eric Wold with B. Riley Securities. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, two questions, I guess. One, just a follow-up, um, um, I can't remember if it was Fredericton that said this, but you talked about um, the dealers seeing, you know, kind of extraordinary low margins right now on boat sales. Um, if, you, if you take floor plan costs out of the equation and try to kind of get to an apples-to-apples -apples basis with, you know, pre-pandemic levels to take interest rates out, are the, are, the, are, the, are the margins are seeing lower than pre-pandemic because of high promotions, or is the extra pressure purely from, from the floor plan costs? And I believe it's it's in addition to the floor plan costs, uh, Eric. Um, it's such a competitive market now uh, that price competition has driven down their margins in addition to the floor plan costs. Right. And, and you know, typically the, the dealers put the floor plan costs in their G&A, so it doesn't affect their margin. Um, so it's, you know, it's very competitive out there and their margin on current product is significantly different than the margin on non-currents. And that's always been the case, but they have more non-currents than is typical. So, uh, you know, typically for dealers, you'll see the non-current margins, you know, coming down and the current margins remaining pretty steady. And I think that's the case, but there are more non-currents now than they've had uh, in the past. And, and do you expect that competitive environment to remain in place even after um, channel inventories get to more healthier levels? Is that kind of a, a different environment right now, or is it merely because of the uh, higher inventories out there? I don't think it will remain at the same level of uh, uh, discounting, but we do expect it to revert to normal, aggressive competition. Hopefully, Hopefully, I'm being clear on my answer. I think it's it's at a peak of competitiveness currently. I don't think it will <laughs> revert anywhere near uh, COVID situations, but I think it'll be much more like uh, pre-COVID period. Got it. And then final question, I may I, I know it's early and not, not necessarily looking for fiscal 25 five guidance, but I guess you know there's there's a hope that interest rates do come down to some degree you know, over the next 12 months or so, I guess, and I, it, you know, I guess, what are, you, what are you hearing from dealers now in terms of any indications in terms of, if they look at a model 25, what level of inventory they're willing to hold on their floors, given interest rates, the competitive environment, you know, macro uncertainty, if you look at that compared to what you may have seen pre-pandemic, I mean, how, how much lower do you think that they're willing to hold inventory versus back, back then? Uh I think the dealers, you know, the way we work with dealers is to project retail demand and balance their inventories accordingly. And so it's all going to depend on, as we enter the year, what the annual business plan is and what our outlook is. And Eric, as you know, we're right now in a period of limited visibility in terms of what next year is really going to look like. So I can't opine on uh, next year with any degree of certainty other than to say is we will know as we finish May and June uh, how we're set up for the following year and how we progress through the summer. My personal opinion is if we see interest rate reductions, that's going to boost consumer confidence and their level of activity in addition to the other benefits that you described with regard to overall financing costs, et cetera. But, you know, will that happen and to what extent will we see those Will the initial rate reduction be a signal that uh, encourages consumers to be more active, or will it take more significant um, reductions? And then how will those reductions uh, play out in terms of short-term rates versus longer-term rates in retail uh, financing for consumers? Perfect. Thank you, guys. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Noah Zatkin with KeyBank. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Um, I, I guess just first, um, 
not not to beat inventory to death. Um, and I know there's obviously a seasonal component um, to, to inventory um, up in the second quarter. Um, but but as you're thinking about it today, um, would you expect to make progress um, on inventory exiting the third quarter, um, or is that kind of more of a, a fourth quarter push? Um, and then relatedly, um, just in terms of the competitive environment, um, what I guess <clears throat> is anything changing, you know, via incentives or promo um, to help clean inventory uh, looking forward relative to, to what, what kind of took place in the second quarter? Thanks. Um, I think the third quarter will see increased competition, um, and that's kind of reflected in our outlook for the third quarter uh, in, in terms of discounting the margins, et cetera, competitiveness. With regard to inventory model, it, it, you know, it peaks seasonally uh, in the third quarter and then is increasingly worked off. So, you know, starts with boat shows and then builds. But as you well know, that fourth quarter is 45 to 50 percent of retail demand, and that's really, you know, uh, what you're trying to predict and forecast and be ready for. Not underestimate, not overestimate. So, um, you see some you know, some movement as sales accelerate in the third quarter, but really it's the fourth quarter when you see the big movement. Got it. That, that's helpful. Um, and then just on the new pontoon brand, um, any additional color on positioning relative to Crest and just maybe some thoughts around um, kind of uh, why now would be helpful. Thanks. Um, Think of it as premium, super premium, if you will. Um, think of it as being, it's going to be a, a very stunning and unique style. Um, and we felt like it deserved a specific attention and positioning given its uniqueness and given its differentiation. So um, the Crest product line is very broad, as you know. Um, covers a, a wide range of price points, um, and they still have, you know, luxury models, and those models will continue to be enhanced as we roll forward, but there will be, a, you know, a positioning and a styling differentiation between the two brands that's significant. Thank you. One moment for our next question. The next question comes from Michael Swartz with Truist Securities. Your line is open. Hey guys, good morning. Um, I think when you when you gave initial guidance for 24 back in I think it was late August, it, it was it was based upon a mid-teens decline in retail demand for the for the fiscal year. I think since then the industry's been down something more in the range of low single digits. So maybe just give us an update on, on you know, what's embedded into your guidance today and, and, and maybe how you're thinking about um, the year playing out. I know a lot's contingent on interest rates, but just, you know, as far as you have visibility today, how, how do you see the year playing out from a retail standpoint? Well, Mike, it's going to vary certainly by brand segment of the market. Um, but you know our, our our view is uh, a little more optimistic than it was, uh, you know, at the start of the fiscal year. Uh, and we're just going to really have to work hard, and the dealers are going to have to work hard for every retail sale. Okay, um, thanks. And then maybe just to follow up on on Aviara, we haven't discussed that in a little bit, but um, some change in leadership uh, sounds like there. I just Maybe give us a, a little bit of a backdrop on, on where we are from a profitability standpoint. I think years ago that the view was that this brand would be, you know, from a profitability standpoint, in line with the corporate average. I guess is that still the target today? Our, our target hasn't changed, and, and, and we believe with a new leader down there that uh, we, we expect this to be an inflection point between a new leader and getting the uh, the four uh, variant uh, model variants of the 28 up to speed. Uh, we expect uh, both those things to be positive uh, for things on a go forward basis. I'd like to think that Q2 was kind of a low point, uh, and we're going to climb out of that. But in the long term, 
we do expect the margin um, opportunity there to be, you know, second only to, to Mastercraft within our portfolio. Okay, great. Thank you. I show no further questions, and this will conclude the question and answer session. Thank you for participating, and this concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.